So uh, I'm Robert Scoble, and I've always been interested in augmented reality, but let's be honest, the first wave of augmented reality just never took off. It, it wasn't very useful to hold up your uh, phone and see uh, like uh, Yelp you know, restaurants near you in augmented reality because it was too jerky, the quality wasn't good enough, and it really didn't do much. And today we have a new company, Deco, that's gonna show us the second wave of augmented reality, which is much more mind-blowing, I think. So let's see it right now. Who are you? Hi, I'm Matt Meisnix, uh, the CEO of Deco. Uh, Deco has been around for two years, and prior to Deco, I was working for one of the first wave uh, of augmented reality companies, and for a decade or so before that, in the mobile data industry in Asia Pacific. So we saw a lot of uh, really exciting trends and feel like Deco is really well positioned to uh, take advantage of this next wave of apps as they move out into the real world. So, you know, I, I've been to Mateo and Munich, which is doing aug augmented reality. They, they made the Lego boxes at yep. Lego stores that you pull, pull over and put in front of a camera and yep. a model pops off the, uh, the box, right? Or we went down to Qualcomm and saw what they were doing with augmented yep. reality. And it's all, I call it the first wave of yeah. augmented reality. It, it, it's cool as a, a demo, but yeah. it's not very useful. It, yeah. it, it, it does, it's not very flexible. And now we're getting wearable glasses like this Google Glass, and I want to look at something like this set of cards and have it yeah. do something, and it doesn't yeah. yet. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so what makes Deco different? What, what is this next wave of augmented reality going to look like, and, and why, why is it going to be different? Yeah, well, um, all of us in, in the company worked in augmented reality you know, prior to, to, to Deco, and we had first-hand experience in exactly the, the user problems that you talked about. We, we felt that the majority of apps that are out there that, that call themselves augmented reality are either you know, science projects or, or marketing gimmicks in, in some way or another. And to go from there to a product that people want to engage with and believe in and, and be immersed in, there are a couple of really difficult problems to overcome, difficult technical problems. Um, the main one was that the app needs to be able to run anywhere. You know, you, if you need a, a, a physical product for the app to work, you know, you've got a problem. Uh, the second one was that the, the product needs to be able to understand the world in 3D. You need to be able to, in real time, build a 3D map or 3D model of the world. And lastly, you needed to think about use cases that didn't require you to you know, do a hands-up display. And you needed use cases that are going to be appropriate for the, the hardware form factor. And so we, we found a deco, really, to, to start with the user problems and work backwards with the technology realized that the technology was an incredibly difficult problem to solve and um, fortunate enough to attract one of the best tech teams in the world and um, focused particularly on these problems and were able to get a, a good year or more you know, head start on some of the larger companies that are working on these things. And the tech's mature and we're building apps, starting to build apps on top of it and it really is a, a totally new type of uh, experience. Well, let, let's have your team in here uh, to help yeah. demo this, because uh, I think people need to see it to you, understand, yeah. to have a context of what makes this different. Right? Yeah. So could you guys come in here with the two iPads and uh, let's, let's see this thing up and close. Uh, by the way, um, sure. this is Pierre. Yeah, introduce and them because yeah, this, uh, they don't have. This is Pierre and Anselm. Um, these guys are, are leading our core technology team. Um, you know, PhDs and Xerox Park and sort of heavy duty backgrounds. Yeah. What we're going to show here is a um, uh, you know a product that we're going to be launching uh, soon, and we're going to show how running locally on the iPad we can do just from a small amount of motion from a single camera build a 3D model of the world in real time. And we, we draw some you know, green grid lines over it so that you can see that it's 3D. It's all running locally on the device. There's nothing on the cloud happening. So how did it sense that, that, that that's a 3D object coming yeah. off the table? It, it works by, because the camera's running, we take a video frame and then we take another video frame and the, the slight movement that just from you know, slightly moving your hands around gives us two different perspectives on that scene in the same way that it, our eyes are able to figure out that it's 3D from having two different angles, we do the same with the different video frames that come in. Okay. And then Pierre's magic is able to uh, figure out how to correlate those two frames together and build that into a 3D model. And that, 
model keeps getting built you know, as the as the device pans around. Now, this only works on what a small area like a table like this. Yeah, could we I, could I take it to a football stadium and and use eventually, it that? yeah, that's exactly where we're going. So we we're constrained right now by pretty much by the hardware on on a you know smartphone or a tablet. Yeah. We can reconstruct in real time about a ten foot by ten foot space today at a resolution of about an inch or just under an inch. Okay. Um, as we get more GPU power, we can scale that 10 by 10 foot area up to you know, much, much larger areas like, like building the tiles on Google Maps. We just keep adding those out. And we are able to process finer and finer resolution on the video frame to eventually get to pixel quality you know, reconstruction. In real yeah, time. right now it looks like a one inch block. Yeah, that's about, kind of about right. It's, we, we sort of talk about this is the... Uh, the, the Tron era of, of AR, like the 1980s Tron, you know, and we're not quite at the Avengers quality of, of you know, realism yet, but yeah. it's, it's a very straight line to get from where we are now to, to there. So, um, what, what is it doing that it, it's laying this 3D mesh over it? Uh, tell me so, what I could do with this. Yeah, so once you have that um, 3D model or 3D map of the world, yeah. we can do a couple of things. The, the, the first and, and most exciting thing is we, we want to um, really launch a category of gaming, or, you know, tabletop gaming, where digital content, whether it's a, a toy car or a, a Star Wars character or a, a, a marble or pull, any... Pull the car up so while he's you know, talking we can yeah, watch the A game. pinball sort of game that where that content can actually start to play in the real world. And see we've built a little ramp here and you can see how a, a car, for instance, can go and jump over the ramp. And we start to you know, have that content playing in the world. It's, it's hidden behind, it's occluded, it crashes into real things. And it's a whole new category of gaming. Wow, that that's, is that's cool. Across the world. And as that scales up, you can imagine those toys starting to become you know, avatars or shopping guides or travel guides, uh, you know, indoor navigation starts to become possible. Uh, we show a, a, a concept video on our website of a, you know, outdoor social, you know, real-time social ambient awareness of what's going on around you. Yep. And uh, those type of use cases, you know, really starts to fan out once we've, uh, once we've solved this first now, one. Now, Google Glass doesn't have enough power, does it, to, to do this kind of stuff? First of all, there's the battery we, isn't good yeah. enough. Yeah. You played this for an hour, your, your Google Glass, this at least the way it exists right now, is going to die. Yeah, that's right. There's some constraints on the current version of, of Google Glass. Um, we think the processing will work great just by running it off a Hangout, a Google Hangout on the back end. Yeah. Um, because you don't actually look through the lens, um, the, the need for real time, you know, 30 frame per second is, uh, you know, isn't so necessary. Yeah. But there's lots of cool use cases, you know, being able to just drop some information or augmentation or, or just a fun. Now, you know. what are we seeing here? We're, we're seeing that there's two cars, and you both are seeing yeah. the, the this same is, this table. This is a world. This is a world first. We uh, we're able to let multiple devices. You know, we're running two now, but we've run it sort of four or five devices in the office, being able to see the same content at the same time in real time and interact with each other. So these guys are having a bit of a smash up derby. But this could be, uh, you know, any time where two people wearing glass want to see the same information at the same time. It could be um, <laughs> at a large event, like a, you mentioned a sporting event or a concert where multiple people want to see something on the stage or see the, you know, the fourth down line at a game. And that um, is, is proprietary technology that we've built to let you, you know, share that view and both become immersed and, and start to interact with, with no, that's content pretty. in the world. It's pretty crazy that you can, yeah. once you get this 3D mesh laid down, that you can sync it yeah. between multiple devices exactly. and have the same. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys are having too much yeah, fun. Yeah. I'm going to kick you Sorry. out of this interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, once we, once we can wow. start sharing between two devices, it means that we can take that 3D model and start to aggregate it in the cloud and share it. And, it lets us start to build 3D maps, 3D models in real time, almost a crowdsourced street view of, so is of it, the real world. Is, is this something that anytime soon, are we going to have 100,000 people in a football stadium, like at the Super Bowl or something? That's exactly what we have. All aiming at, yeah, the, at yeah. the field and seeing things augment off the field? Is yeah, that that's possible? exactly Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where we're going. Um, the, right now you can sync, what, four or five devices? Can uh, we, well, it's we, all on the cloud. We don't so really know what the upper limit is yet. It's, it's kind of, um, yeah, we've, we've run it on everything in our office that we've got, so we, we don't know. Yeah. In, 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it gets exciting when you start thinking about what's, what's possible. And, and obviously the more people are, are that are using it, we're getting more simultaneous views of a scene, which makes the 3D model much more high fidelity, high resolution, and, and just a better quality experience for everybody. Wow. So yeah. y you can really see that the, this is going to take uh, outside uh, gaming. Oh, yeah, way yeah, yeah. Further. Cause it, Playing on a table, I mean, I'm already in front of a table with my kids. Yeah. With a, I can play with a we, Monopoly set or whatnot. Yeah. But playing a game with 100,000 people at the Super Bowl, totally. all with a 3D mesh, yep. and I could see different, you know, different I could even views. see uh, information displays on that field. Exactly, you know, just by yeah. Just turning on something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. We, we uh, I mean, in, internally, we, we, you know, we share a story that I heard from a friend who used to run Microsoft's um, developer organization in the 90s. and. He said when they launched uh, Windows 1.0, uh, the whole graphical interface concept was entirely new. Everyone just knew DOS. And so they um, built Solitaire as a game purely just to, as a familiar thing, you know, dr click and drag cards around, move this part of that part, just as a way to ease people into this whole new type of interaction, this whole new interface. And, and for us, that's what our first game is going to be. And we want just to guide people in, we show them the grid lines, we get a sense of this is entirely new and become comfortable with it. And then work with partners, you know, to build some, to let, you know, initially with tabletop gaming, to let your toys come to life, to let your characters, your favorite game characters step out of the screen. And then we build out the tech roadmap to, to get to these bigger outdoor, multi-user, larger scale, much more exciting types of uh, wow. you know, ideas as well. I so how how hard are you pushing the processor in a modern iPad? You know, uh, uh, pretty hard. Pretty hard. Yeah. So adding more resolution and adding more uh, capabilities on top of that is going to be fairly difficult. We or? we actually push it pretty hard because we we want to make um, as much headroom available for the graphics as we can. Yeah. Um, constructing the model and tracking the position is is difficult to do. Um, but there's a lot of other, um, you know, still unsolved problems. Like there's, there's ways to figure out where the lights are in the real world, and then then put the, sh the digital shadow to match real world light positioning, and all these kind of subtle little things to try and you know get from Tron to you know the Avengers. So we we know that we'll be able to keep pushing the hardware quite hard for quite a few you know cycles, um, but. We know that if we chew all up, if we chew up all the headroom with just the tech, then the, the graphics and the UX and the gameplay and the interactions aren't that aren't that fun. So yeah. um, it's been quite um, quite no, an accomplishment. I'm just wondering how, yeah. how many years. You know, when I I talked to Alvy Ray Smith, who st started Pixar, and uh, yeah, he said, yeah. you know, when when he started his career, he knew a digital movie was possible. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't yet possible. Yeah. <laughs> so um, because he had to wait for yeah. Moore's Law to flip about. You said ten to fifteen times. Yeah. Um, so be we between the time you realized yeah, you yeah. could make a digital movie to where it to was where really it was possible. possible. Yeah, that's a good point. So we um, so to get from where we are today to you know pixel quality resolution in real time, we'll need if you at least one, maybe two cycles of Moore's law on a on a high end tablet um, to then be able to run sort of the lighting and the real dynamic shadowing and things. There's probably another cycle after that. So we know at least so, so at least four that four to eight years somewhere in that. Uh, right at that there. point, it will be quite hard to you know be getting hard to distinguish between what's what's By really in the world. Yeah, yeah. We we wow. kind of I mean, a lot of people th hear augmented reality and they think Terminator as the you know mythological sort of analogy, but we kind of think Roger Rabbit. You know, we want people to say, look, here's these cartoon, fun, engaging characters that are blended in with the real world. You know, much more than you know tracking your face so that you can, you know, find information. Yeah. So I, Well, it's clear the battery life is going to be a huge limiter on these kinds of yeah, devices for yeah. a long time. Yeah. The iPad it has less of that problem. You can, you know, get 10 hours out of an iPad playing yeah, yeah. a video, right? Not here. No, <laughs> This no. will play for an hour playing a video, yeah. right? So the, um, one you're going to turn it on for a sh very short burst, see something, and then turn it back off. Quite likely. There's, there's other techniques where we can use a, a lot of the other sensors in the device as well. Like we can use the inertial sensors, we can use the GPS, we can kind of hand off, you know, processing back and forth and they can compensate for each other in lots of ways. So we s there's a fair bit of um, um, opportunity, I think, to optimize, you know, battery life and power. The 3D mesh that you, uh, that, that your hardware or your software is seeing, yeah. is, 
Is that a fingerprint that you can pull up the next time somebody comes into the scene? Yeah. Can they recognize, oh, I'm at Rackspace Studio San Francisco because yeah. of how it looks? Yeah, yeah. That's part of the, um, you know, I said going from the 10 by 10 to the you know, tiling out, we can okay. start to um, exactly so what you said. Now yeah. we can think about geocaching style of games where I just, you know, bring my iPad along to Disney World, for instance, yeah. and as I walk up to a a new area, it could then augment and show me like totally. the pictures and the Mi things people Mickey like. Mouse pops out in 3D and guides you to the front of the queue because you've just you know bought a, a, a virtual you know virtual game. Um, those sort of things come get really exciting. Whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know we, we we sort of try not to let our imaginations run too far away, but this stuff's all within the next couple of years. So, yeah. do you have any concept of how you're going to monetize this? Is it going to be through selling games or things yeah, in the 3D world? Yeah, it's a uh, initially it's. I mean, we're, we want to be a platform play. That's that's the long term, um, uh, you know, vision for the company. We know though that initially we need to you know, build some games, build some tabletop games. There's, yeah. there's a bunch of fantastic, you know, ideas there. And we'll monetize just as games, um, either selling them or in-app purchases. Um, as we go out to these larger, you know, concepts, um, there's, there's all different monetization options there. But our primary role is to be the enabler of that. Um, I mean, we talk about the real world becoming the operating system, you know, yeah. that, that are apps already you know we either we speak to them we wave at them we strap little sensors all over our body and we sort of the apps are kind of leaking outside the the black box and we want to be the visual layer of you know the visual interface for the real world for the, the real world to become the operating system are you thinking about how uh, to use um, indoor mapping or indoor positioning to know where the where the viewer actually that's is. exactly what we do yeah, I'd, yeah I'd love to use that, that like at, at the gap, for instance, totally. and walk up to the men's jeans with my iPad, and it starts augmenting and doing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's showing so showing me details. Totally, or showing yeah. me a video. Yeah, and then every time you walk through the gap, and every time you use it, you know that contributes to the model that we have of that mall or that that location, that museum, whatever wow. it is. And the next person who comes in gets us gets a slightly better quality resolution, and we can. Yeah. So this morning I was just talking to Intel and you know who's building a contextual API yeah. in hardware to say battery life. Yeah. Is this a play That's where you're going to start perfect. moving pieces of this into the hardware itself? Um, you know, it's, I, 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 yes, I, I guess could call yeah. come by you and then put you know. In yeah, the long years long time. answer is is yes. Uh, the short answer is yes, but but that's. Um, there's still a, a real lot of rapid innovation that's going to happen on the software side. And yeah. to try and take a snapshot today and freeze that in hardware, by the time it gets into the chip, the software will have moved on. And we know that just you know, general purpose chips, um, you know, inertial sensors, um, better cameras, uh, those are just going to drive the software for, for at least two or three cycles through. Wow. But it's, it's certainly, yeah, those sensor fusion is a big Big the thing. the Google Glass brought us a new uh, dimension in that it always knows where I'm aiming, yeah. right? And this doesn't really know that. You know, it, it does when I'm holding it up like yeah. this, but usually I'm I'm just looking at yeah. something, right? Yeah. Um, can your software use those new sensor capabilities? Oh, we already do. Yeah, what we were showing here, we're already using the uh, the gyro to to support the camera rotation. We're using the accelerometer to, to give a sense of gravity. Um, one of the challenges that we're, we're sort of having to work around right now is that the sensors in, in, in the inertial sensors of these devices are pretty, you know, they're cheap. And they're good to tell you, you know, are you portrait or landscape mode, but to give you a, a really high resolution tracking, um, not quite there yet. You know, they're, they're sort of, we're, a Galaxy 4 today has sort of a, a military quality sensor that's from 10 years ago. And, yeah. and as that sort of quality of sensor filters through, um, it'll just, again, it offloads computation power, lengthens battery life, and just makes things work now, better. Now, how did the second iPad know what it was looking at? Uh, yeah, that's what a it, pretty hard thing to do. It and, is, yeah. What to have a, a 3D world that yeah. everybody is synced up on. Yeah, right? so it... it um, so the model we built from the first iPad, we were able to share that you know, through the network and the second one picks up that model. And then um, I think when you mentioned earlier, like how does it know I'm in rack space? You know, we, it, the same thing, it just looks through the camera, grabs the scene and does kind of a search on the, 
the 3D model and says, oh, here's where I am, and it adjusts its position. And once it recovers its position from that, that 3D model, then it starts running and it, it keeps adding to that model itself. Wow. So, and that, wow. that works on a table as well as it works you know, out on the street or, or anywhere else. That's crazy yeah. because that, that's way beyond any of the augmented yeah. reality systems I've seen that are yeah. just yeah, it's just putting a this monster photo. on a yeah, on yeah, a, you know, on a magazine cover. Yeah, or something yeah, exactly. Like that. Yeah. Um, now, if I, if we move this around or if we move the items around, does it that's, know that the scene has changed? Uh, that it? that'll break the tech today. Okay. Um, it's it, it's current research to uh, to be able to support moving objects around. So there's. There's a few different ways you can, can do it. One, one thing that is on our roadmap is to be able to, to track a pre-known object. So the, the, in theory, is like a, like a toy. Like a, yeah. I mean, Skylanders would be a perfect use case for this, where you, you have your figurine, and you're able to recognize that figurine and track it against the real world. And that could let you let, it thing, let a dragon breathe digital fire, or let you know, Darth Vader's lightsaber start glowing, and those sorts of little augmentations on a physical thing that you can move around against the background. But that's, I mean, it's within 12 months for us yeah. to do that, yeah. I notice uh, other uh, augmented reality companies like Augment, they actually like you to use a, a pre-done pattern that they recognize. Yeah. I, I noticed you didn't put one of those out. No, we, we, uh, we have the complete opposite view on that as, as the whole rest of the industry. It's why we, we, it's why we try and avoid the term augmented reality because most people associate it with a certain type of experience that we're, we're trying to do the opposite. Um, a lot of companies today will, will say you you want a the digital to augment the physical like here's my magazine i want to put a digital thing to yeah. you know enhance the print we say other way around you should start with a great digital experience that works anywhere and if it happens to see a physical product in the scene the physical augments the digital so if i brought a can of red bull into my racing car game it should go ah that physical thing now turns into a flaming loop of fire that if I can jump through it, I get a discount on my next six pack of Red Bull. And so that, that sort of reversal of the physical augmenting the digital is, is sort of how we approach it and why we're not really interested in, in working with you know, marketing campaigns and things because it's, it's just a totally opposite way of looking at the, at the experience. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How long, uh, tell me about the company that you're building. I, how much investment have you Yeah, had we've, so we've raised a little bit over $3 million. That's from, all? That's all. This should be like forty. You know, Flipboard got forty. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's yeah. going on? That's exactly. <laughs> so. This is actually rocket science. Compared it is. To Flipboard. <laughs> it is literally rocket science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've patented the whole, all the stuff, so it's we're, we're really excited. Uh, we've got four, four patents in them, and some pretty, some pretty good ones. You know, stuff like yeah. content interacting with the real world and the multiplayer stuff. Um, but we've, yeah, we've really built the tech. We've built a, a use case on top of it, and uh, we're now launching that right now, and then. We want to look at another round of funding to scale up, you know, in, in summertime. Yeah. So. Well, uh, how many employees do you have? Uh, we're five and about five part time. Five people so built in, this. Yeah, yeah, over about two years. Yeah. That's. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good it team. It shows you what's possible with five, five with a small team. Yeah, yeah, yeah a good a good team. Yeah. That's amazing. It's, um, yeah. Where, so the next year is mostly about shipping what you're showing me here? The, yeah, the net, well, we're shipping sort of now. Yeah, shipping. the next year is about um, productizing or turning the tabletop gaming into a, into a business. Um, and as well as just keeping that tech roadmap, you know, moving, moving forward. We, we feel like it's a, you know, we're in a, in a bowling alley and tabletop gaming is the first sort of vertical opportunity, vertical market that we've enabled. And so we want to you know, commercialize that uh, as well as keep moving on to that next, you know, the next enabler um, yeah. for, you know, for the future. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited. I, I, I'm interested in s not the tabletop, but where you're going to take this, yeah. like at sporting games yeah, or stuff. Because yeah. I was just at the Mets uh, game. Yeah. And, you know, you, you aim a camera at, at the field and it's largely wasted space. It yeah. doesn't show you anything. Yeah. I, I assume in the future you're going to put all sorts of stuff there for me. That's exactly what we want to do. Yeah, give you that, uh, that especially the, we want to build out the multiplayer as well. Like, uh, it, although it's fun for the game right now, the, the real interest is in the, the potential to crowdsource an experience and have yep. lots of people giving a great rich, and whether it's a sporting event or a rock concert or a family picnic, you know, we want that. Um, that ability to, to 
have that 3D understanding of the space you're in, in, in real time. Yeah, and since this 3D mesh that's over yeah. the, virtual, the real world uh, is all the same, I bet you could play different kinds of games with that mesh. Right? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, we, one way to look at it is that you leave the mesh invisible and, and then the, the digital character sort of bumps into or jumps over real world things. Um, we, we're just experimenting now with starting to color that mesh and turn it into pixels and really as you look at the world it'll turn into a you know an 8-bit video game where you'll have you know large pixels coming in you can start to play breakout you know like on your table or break out against the wall or yeah. um, you know Tetris you know on the table and eventually outdoors those sort of um, sort of changing the world as you're looking at it is uh, is something that's, that's are you using the well. camera to actually look at the content of the of the things on the table we, as well? We aren't trying to... Like, can you tell the difference between a Wired magazine and this magazine? We're not doing that. I mean, there's, okay. there's no um, reason why we couldn't, apart from just processing power and, and yeah. time, but... You could see with a playing card game or something like yeah, that. Yeah, just, just some recognition of, of things. So we, yeah. we're really focusing on um, um, building the structure of the world for an unknown scene. So if you try to get into, um, you know, recognising that this is a, a pack of raisins, um, that's a, a totally different technical domain that we've you know, chosen to stay away from because it's, it's a hard problem on its own. Yeah. Um, we can definitely work with partners that could do that, but not, it's not what we're building. Very cool. Anything yeah. else I need to know about that? I, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I could talk all day. So I, it's, What's uh, the back end of this? Because like? you're doing most of this on the local machine. Everything right now runs locally. Yeah, well, every, except for the syncing. Except for the multiplayer, yeah, the, the syncing stuff. So. Um, is that up on the cloud? Like, what, what kind of cloud? Yeah, it, it runs through the cloud, but we're not. It's part of our next, you know, roadmap thing is to start to actually store that data and, and build that large map. We're not doing that yet. Okay. So we're really just been hammering on. Uh, you know, most of our work's been on the user experience. Yeah. We found that's the biggest. We had the tech running a year ago, and we've spent a year learning how to um, explain to a user what's going on without having to stand behind them. Um, the concept of moving your, your device around is no other app needs you to do that. Um, no. People, uh, even, even explaining to them, just understanding that um, the content is really in the world, not on your screen, was a you know, mental barrier that we had to sort of understand and learn about and learn how to communicate that. Yeah, that's um, why you show the grid lines right now. Why, yeah, exactly, it's why we show the grid lines. There's no technical reason to show the grid lines. It's why we actually have a, have a car like an RC car because people are used to holding something in their hands and controlling it at a distance. Um, we initially prototyped using a, a little monkey that runs around your desk and people would sort of go, why is there a monkey on my desk? You know, like they couldn't quite, you know, it was like two things they had to get their head around. So we've just simplified that, that learning curve and tried to make it gradual. We've simplified the, the interface to yeah. interact with the technology. There's lots of, even, even like the game design sort of questions that no one's ever had to, um, uh, think about before, like how do you design a game where the scene is out of your control? Yeah. How, how do you design a game where the user moves the camera around and you can't control that? So uh, these are kind of really yeah, interesting. We're problems. seeing a bunch of things flying uh, over uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the desk right now, which is crazy. Uh, you can your mi your mind is really unlimited in this new completely. World. Yeah, yeah. Our, our biggest problem as a team is how do we think smaller you know we, we're constantly thinking how do we how do we make this less 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 because um, there's this there is this learning ramp that, that we need to be able to meet people where they're at and, and just gradually bring them up this ramp and and we see it happen all the time where you know at some point sort of the light goes on and people go does that mean you can do this does that mean you can do this and and that's when yeah the yeah. minds are blown yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, do we have one last demo maybe to yeah, come and see before we shut off the camera? Sure, we can show the, the, the pixel world going on the... Yeah, so yeah. Y you actually uh, can change the grid into different In representations yeah, of what's yeah. going on here. We can actually, do we, does anyone want to lie on the desk and well, do whatever? Anyways, you guys are not mics, so nobody's going to hear what you're saying. Oh, okay. But what's, what's this going on? This oh. is... This is a, a, a real reconstruction of uh, just a screenshot of Pierre's face. He laid down on the desk and we, we ran the grid lines over him and then we, we pressed a pixelized button and we turned him into a 3D set of cubes. 
and we want to. Uh, that's going to, um, and this is very much a working prototype for us, and we want to be able to let you capture this model at a little bit higher resolution and then export it into Minecraft or export it into you know, other games or other models. So Got it. Ultimately, you want to do that, and, you know, and copy you and paste the real that. world. So I think we should do that. You're showing that You should digitize here. somebody. You can uh, digitize yeah. me. <laughs> Won't be the last time. <laughs> or the first yeah. I think that'd be awesome. And so what are we seeing here? Um, so, this, so that's a... Well, nobody can hear you. So, uh, so this is this is the uh, Piers just grabbing the grid of the world right now, and then he's going to in real time turn it into a you know, nineteen eighties computer game version of, of the real world. Okay. Um, where we see all those cubes come up. Oh yeah. So this this is something that we we want to have running in real time as you you know you walk down the street and see that. You know. Wow. So that really so shows that you, you can once you have that underlying grid, you can do. Oh, anything. we can do all yeah. sorts of stuff. I mean, we I mean again, we, if we put our you know, start imagining we can track objects and we could render a, um, you know, a, a World War II sort of facade over the cross of uh, the top of streets to let you do a Call of Duty style game in, in the world or a science fiction version of, you know, of your space. We should get Scoble to hold still and we should, we should do him. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll end the interview with that. Okay. Uh, where can we learn more about what you guys are doing? Uh, our website is uh, deco.co. D -E spell it out. D-E-K-K-O dot C-O. Um, you can follow us at Twitter at, at Deco, and we will be launching our first game in a couple of weeks and more products coming straight after that. Very cool. And where are you guys located? Here in San Francisco. Oh. Um, we're down near the Caltrain. And are you guys hiring? Or of course. We're, what we're looking to build out now is um, uh, a really some, a great 3D game building competency in the, in the company. So anyone with a background in game design, uh, game production, uh, 3D art, um, come and talk to us. Wow, that's really cool. So here we really get to see the blocks yeah. and, and the yeah. birds of the bird. Huh? Yeah, the birds. So Converting the bird into a, a really this, a 3D. Yeah, and this took us about a day's work. Like once we had the model there to turn it into this pixel, you know, cubification, it's, uh, it, was, it was really straightforward. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for coming in and uh, it's really us. great stuff. I, I'm looking forward to seeing where this world goes because so yeah. You can see by 2020, it, this is going to be a very sharp world, and we're yeah. going to have glasses and all sorts of different yeah, devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it's inevitable. It, it mean, has that feeling. I wouldn't be shocked if you guys get purchased really quickly by some company. You know? Yeah, this it's, it's, <laughs> we're definitely you know what we're doing. We know is of interest to chip manufacturers, handset manufacturers, and some of the bigger um, web social search type of players that are out there. Um, we, I mean, my, my background um, was, started my career, I worked for a dial-up infrastructure company called Ascend Communications, yeah. saw that wave, I then went and worked for phone.com who invented WAP and we saw the smartphone wave come through. This is the same sort of wave, you know, this, I don't know what it's gonna be called, the Internet of Things or natural user interfaces or. I call it contextual computing, which covers everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's happening in this space. It's, it's exactly that trend, you know, of, the, of these apps kind of leaking out into the, into the world and, yeah. um, we just, you know, whenever a, a wave like that hits, you know, it runs for like a decade and, and the opportunities for startups to become significant, large, long-term companies um, is, is real and it's exciting and that's, that's really what we're playing for. Um, you know, we're not looking to build a feature and, and flip it to a, you know, be, be a department in somewhere else. So it's exciting opportunities, exciting world and we're, we're going hard. Very cool. Can't wait to see what you guys do. So Thank you. Thanks and uh, congrats on getting to this point with what, a, a million dollars? You said three, three million. Three million dollars. Yeah, yeah. That, it's over the last two years. You know, that, that's what that's we're still impressed. amazing that you can build a company of this kind of quality with three million dollars. Yeah, well, thanks. That's great. Yeah. So thanks so, so much. All right. Thank you.